Many thanks for the introduction. And I would also like to thank everyone here for taking the time and trouble to be with us for the El Dorado presentation. Sunday, you could have been doing lots of other things. My thanks also go out to the Caribvic Organization and Committee for asking me to present and to Pat for suggesting it in the first place. The presentation is non-political, mainly historical, and designed to reach Guyana in a different way. Now, I will be talking about the fabulous legend of the gold of El Dorado and the Guyanas. But I could also be talking to you about El Dorado, <laughs> the legend of the world's best rum, you see? With, with, with due respect to Barbados and Trinidad and Jamaica, the best rum in the world. Anyway, so we change. But in fact, I will be taking us back through the history of the El Dorado legend and the Guyanas and going back to Sir Walter Raleigh and beyond. We're going to explore El Dorado <coughs> and the Guyanas. Now in the search for gold in Central and South America, the Spanish had it all over the Dutch, the French, and the English. Gold was the oil for wars, conquests, and power. And at that point in time, there was a lot of wars going on between those, those countries. The legend of El Dorado circulated with tales of fabulous gold treasures and cities rich with gold. And that legend started huge interest, particularly in England, but also in France and Holland. The Spanish already had Mexico and the, and the Incas in, in, in Peru. So in, um, he was commissioned in 1595 by Queen Elizabeth I, not the second, to go and find El Dorado for queen and country. There was a lot of traveling, a lot of exploration, but however, the mission was a complete failure with no El Dorado and no gold found in the Guyanas. The result, in 1618, he lost his head. He was beheaded as a failure and particularly after the queen, who was his mentor, died in 1616, so about two years before he was, he was beheaded. But let us first go back a little further than this date with the Spanish in Mexico. <clears throat> the Spanish liked to show the conquest of the Aztecs with superior weapons and, on the other hand, noble savages. But in fact, the Aztecs were way ahead with superbly armed and numerically superior warriors. Herman Cortez deceived after asking for a peaceful meeting with Moctezuma, and he seized Moctezuma. He slaughtered his unarmed nobles. The Spanish then introduced diseases. They allied with other tribes to fight against the Aztecs, and then they later made those same tribes slaves as well. Moctezuma was imprisoned and soon after killed by the Spanish. I'd, I'd like to show you this, you know, because the west side of Central and South America had developed huge civilizations and cities with advanced cultures, massive pyramids, and religions. These pyramids were not quite as large as the Egyptian pyramids, but they were far, far more numerous throughout Mexico and, 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 and particularly in the Central American area. They were built by the Mayans, the Olmecs, and, and the Toltecs, who predated the Aztecs in, in thing. Now, you have trouble pronouncing this word. It's Tenochtitlan. <laughs> and Tenochtitlan, in the 1300s, had enormous temples and palaces with a huge ceremonial center. And the Aztecs, after an alliance with two other tribes, the Texcoco and the Talapan, in 1430, they made Tenochtitlan the capital and major city of the, of their, uh, of, of the Aztecs. Now, Tenochtitlan was built on a lake in 1325. And even today, the engineering skills to build such a city over a lake with temples, houses, sewers, running water, fresh water to drink is still not fully understood. 
And Tenochtitlan, when first seen by the Spanish and Cortes, was much larger, grander, and far more developed than any of the other major European cities. The population in Seville, which was reputed to be the largest city at the time, was estimated at around 100,000. And this would also have included Madrid, Barcelona, Lisbon, Rome, and Paris, and London. Now, that is a little bit of an exaggeration there, I think. They would have had about 250. There are some people who said 700,000. I don't personally believe that. It would be somewhere between 250, but at least three times as large as Seville, okay? Now, anyone cares to hazard a guess as to where Tenochtitlan is today? Anyway, just guess. Nobody. It is Mexico City. The, the Spanish built Mexico City over Tenochtitlan, and the foundations were so strong that it still exists in that capacity today. And Greater Mexico City right now is 21 million people. Quite a problem for disposing of garbage, but, <laughs> but 21 million people. And the lake that was built was Lake Texcoco. Now, <clears throat> the Spanish destruction of, of the Aztecs. The truth is that it was smallpox. And by 1521, it had virtually wiped out the remaining Aztecs and the warriors, mm -hmm. along with the murder of the emperor, of course, way back, of Moctezuma. At the start, Cortes only had about 500 soldiers and about 300 porters or slaves who would carry the weapons and look after the horses. The total Aztec population was about 5 million, with an army of 200,000 warriors and 100,000 porters to carry their weapons. Now, before the Aztecs, they have, and that's a funny, um, that, re that represents the Olmecs. They, they, they built that huge kind of round face. The Olmecs and the Mayans and the, and the, and the Toltecs and the, and the Aztecs with their magnificent temples. And then, yes, it was, it was El Dorado to the Spanish and Cortes, but, re but sadly for gold and conquest, the destruction of the Aztec Empire was immense. I'll go back to this Mayan pyramid, because just to show you once again, no one, it, they still exist. I think someone was there recently. Was it, was, not you, uh, no, anyway. It, they still exist, and um, they are quite incredible in Honduras and Guatemala and in, in, and in Mexico. Okay. So, now it's time to move on into South America, again on the western side. And it is to go on to the mighty Incas in, in Peru. And this shows Atahualpa, the emperor of the, of the Incas, and another Spanish conquistador, Fran Francisco Pizarro, just as cruel as Cortes, let me tell you. Okay? Now, this is a little bit tricky for you to see, but the, 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 the Inca empire extended all the way up into a, a north to Colombia and all the way south into Chile. An incredibly huge area, almost as big as what was then considered to be Europe. And it was loaded with gold. Now, one, yes, I was going to say immediately when one thinks of Peru, one, the name of one space jumps to mind. And uh, yes, it is Machu Picchu, uh, a legendary city uh, there, which was never found by the Spanish conquistadores and was never destroyed. The actual function of Machu Picchu is in much debate. Was it a religious center? Was it built for the Inca uh, emperor and his nobles? Nobody really knows, but thank God it, it's still in a relatively good position and somewhere over five million visitors go to Machu Picchu every year. So it's a huge um, thing. Okay. Now that is an example of an Inca fortress in Peru. It's called Saxe Woman and is one of many of the Inca fortresses in Peru. No one 
can easily explain how the Incas built such constructions. No wheel, no pulleys, no horses, nobody knows. And uh, there's lots of um, theories and projections about how they could do such a thing. Look at the size of the man standing by one stone. Now, for the girls, you will notice that back then, even in Peru, the, woman, the word woman was predominant in the language of the Quechuas, Saxe woman. So good on you. It wasn't Saxe man, it was Saxe woman. <laughs> you know? Okay. Now, you may, um, I just mentioned the word uh, Quechua. Now, uh, Quechua, these are the Quechua Indians as they are today. They're dressed pretty much the same as that. Um, with beautiful costume, uh, colorful costumes. Well, no, it's not really costumes, but clothes. And, um, and Quechua was and is the language of the Incas. But what you might not know, which I didn't know particularly, it is Quechua is the most widely spoken Amerindian language with over 8 million speakers still speaking Quechua. In Peru, a quarter of the people still speak Quechua, the original Inca language, but about a third speak no Spanish. So we go now to uh, the legendary land, South America. The source of the legend of El Dorado. And I wanted to show you that, that um, slide because it demonstrates the size of South America, which again, it is twice the size of Australia, South America. Brazil is the size of, of um, Brazil there is the size of Australia, and the rest of it is equal to Brazil. It is huge, massive, and of course in the middle of it is the Amazon. Now, now for a bit of trivia, which I find fascinating. The distance from Santiago in Chile to a tiny island called Easter Island, in Spanish, Isla de Pascua, is about 4,000 kilometers. And it takes about five hours by a modern jet aircraft to fly from there. On Easter Island, there, there are two fascinating things. One is the Moai, huge. I mean, again, it's hard to show you everything. But if you could just judge the size of the people there with the Moais, they had no metal, they had no horses, they had no pulleys, they had nothing. And yet they built it. A lot of the Moai are still buried in the ground. When they excavate it, they go all the way down into, into the earth. Nobody understands that. The other fascinating thing that intrigued me was that on Easter Island, 4,000 kilometers away, there is an Inca-style wall built exactly as you would see in Peru. And so you could ask the question, why? How is it? Is it still a mystery, you know? But we go back to South America. And a few of you might be already asking, why are we speaking so much about the western half of South and Central America when the eastern half is about twice the size of the West. Well, El Dorado was supposed to be in the eastern half. That's the legend. And that's what they were searching for. The Spanish already had the gold from Mexico and, 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 uh, and Peru and so forth, a little bit in Chile, not much. But the Spanish held that for themselves. The English, the Dutch, and the French wanted some gold as well, and they believed that there was a, a place called El Dorado. But in that vast area, there are no certifiably discovered or known highly developed civilizations or large cities or pyramids. You could ask why. There have been lots of tales and rumors about lost cities, and many adventurers and expeditions have gone looking for them. Many lost their lives in the searches and were never ever found again. And more recently, in 1925, an English explorer called Colonel Percy Fawcett, he disappeared in the wilds of the Amazon, never to be heard from again. He was in search of a fabulous lost city of gold called Z. 
another part of the Eldorado, Eldorado legend. However, more recently, new and advanced aerial searches have uncovered what could have been a huge Amazonian civilization. And could it have been that the Amazon was actually highly urbanized? Now, it may, it may not be the Aztecs or the Incas, but anthropologists have uncovered evidence of settlements. But the Amazon is not an easy place, and the jungle takes over all in time. Now, have a look at that. That is, uh, and we, we'll touch about this a little bit more later on. That is Timiri in Guyana. And they are petroglyphs, carvings in the rocks that suggest that there must have been some type of uh, civilization going on in, in the Guyanas at the time. That's those carvings, the petroglyphs also exist in Suriname, in Cayenne, part of Venezuela, and, and south of Brazil. Now, I've, I've, <laughs> I've termed this slide the weird three Guyanas, right? And the question that you might say, why? Well, there are only just go down to the next one. There are only three countries in the whole of South America that speak no Spanish, no Portuguese. They speak French, Dutch, and English. You know, and you got to say it to yourself, that's kind of weird, you know? Um, and, and they all speak it with Creole accents just to confuse the colonial powers, you know? <laughs> so we go on now to uh, Cayenne, French Guiana, uh, some people immediately think of Devil's Island, um, etc. And I put that slide up, Cayenne. The French never give away very much. They don't seem to give away very much, right? So the Spaniards, and just bear with me, there's a little bit of detail coming up throughout the, con uh, the, the presentation, but it's important. The Spanish explored the Guianas, the coastline in 1500. And they actually settled around the Cayenne area in 1503, but they soon left. There was no gold, there was no El Dorado to be found. French merchants from Rouillon and Paris opened a trading center in 1624. And they founded the city, they, they called it Cayenne City in 1643, some 19 years later. As the French. But then, the Dutch West Indies Company that you may have heard of was a huge and powerful organization. And in 1658, they came, they took it away from the French, and they established the Dutch colony of Cayenne. So the Dutch were in charge of it, right? The French returned in 1664, <laughs> and, it, and they founded a second settlement. But that was quickly attached, attacked by the Dutch and wiped out. But there's a treaty called the Treaty of Breda, going back to 1667, and the area was given back to France. And French Guiana, or Cayenne, has been an overseas territory of France since then, with a huge military rocket base in Cayenne. In Cayenne, but in Kourou, it's called Kourou. Again, that's not, uh, it's not widely known, right? The Ariane commercial rockets are launched from Kourou, and they also have nuclear rockets based, the French have based nuclear rockets in Kourou, and they've got about 30,000 French personnel and soldiers guarding that area with uh, jet military aircraft uh, supporting it as well. So we go forward one more to manage into uh, Dutch Guiana, which is now Suriname. So Suriname sits in the middle. You remember the slide? French Guiana, Suriname, British Guiana, Venezuela, Brazil, etc. <clears throat> the early history of Suriname dates from 3000 BC, when native Amerindians inhabited the area. The recorded history of the Guianas of the Guianas dates back to 1499, call it 1500, when a Spaniard Alonso first arrived from Spain. The explored history of the Guianas has been shaped by the colonial policies of the Spanish, the French, the Dutch, and the English. In 1649, the Dutch controlled everything. So again, maybe not so difficult to see, but there, that's the Dutch. They controlled all the three Guyanas. They were, they were in charge. 
<clears throat> the first written reference to the region as a whole, as I mentioned, was about 1599 with a map, actual map. In 1498, it was Christopher Columbus who also sighted the coast of Suriname. But what the hell was he doing there? He was supposed to be in the Caribbean, you know, <laughs> you know landing people in, in, the, in the Caribbean. But anyway, he was there. And in, 14, um, he, uh, in 1593, Spanish explorers visited the area and named it Suriname. Why? After the name of the native Amerindians, the Suriname, the Suriname. And that name has stuck. In 1600 to, uh, to 1650, about 50 years, settlements were attempted by the Spanish, Dutch, French, and British, but all failed because of resistance by the native inhabitants, but also due to the effects of disease like malaria, typhoid, yellow fever, etc. A year later, about 1651, the first permanent European settlement in Suriname was established by the British in Paramaribo. And Paramaribo is still the capital city. So you know, the British are, are, are there, right? In 1667, so quite a while afterwards, the British exchanged their part of Suriname to the Netherlands. They gave it back to the Dutch. Quite gladly, they gave it back to the Dutch in exchange for New Amsterdam in America. Do you think you have any idea what New Amsterdam in America is now today? New York City. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, New York City. So <laughs> we're not going to say if it was a good exchange or a bad exchange, right? <laughs> you know? And um, the Dutch were, you know, they, they were quite incredible. They built these massive forts along the Burbese River and the Kanji River areas. I'm sure Guyanese would know the Kanji and the Burbese Rivers. Perhaps a quick explanation to the others. Guyana is Essequibo, Demerara, and Burbese, three major areas, all with massive rivers, right? Now, after they took um, uh, control of it with the, um, with the Dutch fort, they, they established coffee and sugar plantations along the Burbese and the Kanji areas, and it was worked by, by slaves from Africa. In 1799 to 1802, it was total control by the Dutch. But slavery in Suriname was very difficult. This hit the next one. It was, it was particularly difficult. Now, although slavery was officially abolished in, six, in 1863, the Dutch planters, they brought in indentured laborers from as far as we, as India, China, and Indonesia. Indonesia, of course, was also colonized by the Dutch. There were a lot of slave funerals in Suriname. Many slaves died under the lash, starvation, and overwork. So once again, I'd like to just not overemphasize the point, but, and there's a reason for this, but it, it, it was terrible. There was also African slaves, again, this is not well known, called, they call themselves, they were eventually termed the Maroons, and they escaped from the Dutch, the plantations, into the jungles. And they, they lived there, and they survived there, they fought against the Dutch troops, they never were conquered, and I have a feeling that in Jamaica, there's also the Maroons. That's right, you see? So the name is quite synonymous, the Maroons, where they escaped and they fought the British in, in Jamaica, right? The Suriname Maroons, even today, they live pretty much like they did as they did back home in Africa. And that's not a bad thing. They've kept the language going. Well, they actually have a slightly different language, which they call Maracana, um, and they mix with the, with the native Amerindians, and they, they, they exist there today, right? So we move forward slightly. As a result of this terrible slavery, there was a revolt in the Dutch area of Burbese in February 23, 1763, led by a guy called Cuffy, with over 2,000 slaves. 
out of a total of 4,000. So half the slaves decided enough is enough, we're going to fight, okay? The plantation after plantation uh, fell. The whites who were caught were, were massacred, the Dutch whites. And the Dutch then, the, the, the remaining balance fled northward. For a year, the rebels held on to southern Burbies while the remaining British whites were able to hold on to the north. Eventually, only about half of the Dutch white population in the colony remained. The rebels came to number about 3,000 out of the original 4,000 slaves, and they threatened control over the Guyanas. But might is power in a sense, and the insurgents were e eventually defeated in the spring of the year later, which was 1764, with the assistance of troops from neighboring French and British colonies and in the Caribbean and from Europe. They called in reinforcements, they got cannons, they got muskets, they got whatever, and they put down the, uh, the revolution. Cuffey, who was the leader, he was, um, he was killed in, in late 1963, so actually before they fell in 64. And, but there was also a lot of infighting amongst the rebel leaders, some brilliant, brilliant um, guys, um, but he died. He is now the national hero of Guyana from the Dutch Burbis uprising. Why? Because Burbis is part of Guyana, so he is revered as a national hero of Guyana. In 1823, there was another slave uh, uprising of some 10,000 slaves in what was then British Guyana, led by a guy called Kwamena. But that is another story for another time, and it wasn't a violent revolution like what we, a rebellion like what we saw here in Suriname. The street in Georgetown that I was born in was Murray Street. It's now Kwamena Street. So his name is carried forward. And Cuffey again is commemorated, as I mentioned, with a statue in the monument in the square of the revolution in the capital, Georgetown. In 1954, Suriname was given full autonomy with the Netherlands, but they maintained control over defense and foreign affairs. And it was only until 1975 that Suriname gained its full independence from the Dutch. A lot of people think of Guyana, but they never actually look at Guyana in their minds. On one side is the Atlantic Ocean. On the south and down here is Brazil. Northwest is um, Venezuela. And on the east is Suriname. So it actually has three borders um, surrounding uh, Guyana, as it is today. And the Venezuelans are giving us a little bit of trouble in the northwest area there. It's something to think about. The population, no, 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 well, it's all right. Yeah, you can go there. The population of, of Guyana, as of today, is not very big, okay? It's about 800,000 people. I think there must be 800,000 people living overseas, you know? <laughs> Went to Canada or Australia, wherever, you know? A pity, but that's the way it is. So 40% of the population is Indo-Guyanese, 30% Afro-Guyanese, 20% mixed races, and 10% Amerindian, Chinese, Portuguese, etc. Now, I think it's quite a resplendent coat of arms. Quite magnificent in its own right. That's in 1966, that was the coat of arms granted to Guyana. It includes an Amerindian headdress. I think I can get it there for you. Just up there, Amerindian headdress. It symbolizes the indigenous peoples of the country. Not us, but the Amerindians, right? And I think that's a, a great thing. And then the two diamonds are on either side, which sell, um, symbolizes the mining industry and the wealth of the country. Two jaguars, as the national symbol, holding a pickaxe, a sugar cane, and a stalk of rice, the agriculture. It has a shield decorated with the Victoria lily. That's, that Victoria lily is, is quite, a, quite a famous thing. I, I have another picture of them later on. And three wavy lines, which represent the three major rivers, Essequibo, the Demerara, and the Burbis River. And the national motto, which again I think is, is 
quite beautiful. It's one people, one nation, one destiny. The golden arrowhead. Hmm? The bird. Oh, I'm sorry. The bird is the kanji pheasant. <laughs> the, kanji, the kanji pheasant is the national bird of Guyana. And it features again in the, in the other one coming up. You're keeping me on my toes, you know. <laughs> good, good on you. Now, the golden arrowhead, I think, is a very distinctive flag. When you see it flying, oh, there's one back there by Pat. Yeah. Yeah. And one behind me as well. Yeah. That, that. The colors are symbolic of Guyana. They were chosen to be symbolic of Guyana. With green, doesn't show up very good here, but green for agriculture and forest, white for the rivers, the rivers, and, uh, and water, and gold for the mineral wealth of Guyana, which is quite extensive, black for endurance, and red for zeal and dynamism. So what the hell am I doing in Australia, you know? <laughs> you know? Now, the president also has a coat of arms, very similar, so we won't run it through. But there you've got a better picture of the kanji pheasant, right? A little bit larger, right, you know? And it's, it's quite an interesting little bird. Um, not too big, but like about the size of a, of a turkey. Now, Guyana. The word Guyana is an Amerindian word, from, and it means the land of many waters. They started with that. They said, this is Guyana. And the rivers and the, and the, and the falls are superb. Kaichur Falls. Um, Orenduik down here at the bottom, and I'm not sure about this one here. I think this one is, um, anyone could guess that one? I think it's Sura, Sura, Sura huh? Araku. I think, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're right there. Orenduik is, is quite spectacular in its own right. Kaichur is much more spectacular. Kaichur from memory is about four to five times the height of Niagara. I mean, it is massive, you know, falling down. And well in, when in full flow, it is quite amazing. Um, if we could just go back uh, slightly. Um, this is the gorge, and you can, f you can fly up there, and you can walk to the, to the point and look down. Don't jump. <laughs> and I don't think it's allowed anymore, but the Guyana Airways, with twin engine, otters, etc., They would take about, about the pilot plus about five passengers and the seat and four behind, and they would fly up that gorge. And you would see this massive amount of water coming down. You say, shit, I hope I got out my pants, you know? <laughs> and then at the last moment with the updraft from that, the power of the water going up and pulling back, they would actually just, just go over the top of Kaichur, you know? So, Quite an experience. That's not allowed anymore. <laughs> Guyana it couldn't afford the loss of an aircraft, you know. Yeah. So, so that's that's Orenduik. Now the Amerindian tribes of Guyana. These are the indigenous people, right? You know. Um, looking, a searching. <laughs> anyway. I'll just go a bit closer now. Okay, the Waru. They, they were believed to have been, um, to be the oldest known ones, inhabitants, going back to about 7,000 years. The Wapishanas, the Makushis, and the Waiwais, along with the Arawaks, the Caribs, and the Patamonas, and the Akawais. Now, the Caribs are also known in Trinidad. They were Trinidad Caribs. They were also known in, 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 in Venezuela. So they must have been great travelers to jump from all these places and, and end up in, in all those countries, you know. I think it might have gone. It doesn't matter. Um, but they were there. So then we just move on a little bit. These are actual pictures of, of Amerindians even today. I think I've lost the power, so it doesn't matter. 
uh, battery. It's all right. Yeah. So what, you know, to a large extent, not totally, but to a large extent, they still try to maintain their culture, their, their way of dress, their way of life, etc. And this is a shot with an Amerindian fishing with a bow and arrow for fish. And that was quite a common way of catching fish in, in the rivers. Uh, quite quite a, amazing, you know. Is there a, that's an actual shot of the, the Wapishanas. Um, the Makushis, the Wapishanas, and the Waiwais are now the three major Amerindian uh, tribes left in Guyana. The others have uh, seemed to have disappeared. Uh, I'm, yeah. Hmm. yeah, 49. I've put this up with three different flags, and I've called it the musical cheers of, of Guyana. And it was musical cheers because it went from one to the other to the other, and it was quite incredible. So the culture of Guyana was built into these three colonial powers, you know. Um, in Trinidad, you might have had the Spanish originally, but you never had the Dutch and the French and all of that, you know. We had the whole world, you know. <laughs> they were all looking for El Dorado. Okay, so now we see here, that's a shot I, I found of French troops um, in Guyana. And then, this is just a little history, you know, but I don't want to go over too much. Early 17th century Dutch control, British comes back in 81, French back in for two years in 82, back to the Dutch, back to the British, back to the Dutch, and then back to the British in that year. And since then, we have been independent. Thank God for that, you know. You know, you know. We got it. Okay, now that's an example of, a, of an existing ruin of an old Dutch fort, uh, and it's called Kijkoverall. And Kijkoverall in the Dutch was sea overall, means that I could see overall uh, with a commanding view of the river. Uh, the Dutch position changed slightly in that part of the world because the European powers were gaining much more control of the colonies in the Caribbean. So although Guyana was originally claimed by the Spanish, and they still try to tell us about that in the Northwest, and they sent pat patrols through the, er the region, it was really the Dutch who gained total control of all the Guyanas, as we mentioned, in the 16th to 17th century. Dutch sovereignty was officially recognized by a treaty in Europe in 1648. They say, yeah, it's yours, it's yours, you know. <laughs> and, and huge numbers of slaves were once again captured and transported to the Guyanas as slaves. And we mentioned the African slave rebellions in 73 and, and in 1823. And those were seminal moments in, in Guyana's history. Not yet. A little bit more, unfortunately. In 1781, war broke out between the Dutch and the British. They were fighting each other. You've got to remember Napoleon and all of these guys, you know. <clears throat> and the result of that was that the British got on top, and they reoccupied Burbis, Esquibo, and Demerara. In 1782, the French allied with the Dutch. <laughs> Amazing. And they went back and took control of, of the British colony of the three areas that I mentioned. Now, the French governed for two years. And this time, they built a capital city at the mouth of the Demerara River, and they called it Longchamps. The Dutch regained control in 1784. They occupied the French capital of Longchamps and re renamed it Stabroek. The capital in 1812 was eventually renamed Georgetown, <laughs> as it is today by the British. So we just go one more forward. So that's just a shot show showing that uh, what could have been. I could never understand when I look at those, those um, how the people could have worn such heavy clothes <laughs> in that hot, humid climate, you know? <laughs> you know? But, but they did, and um, it was quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. So Stabroek changed back to Georgetown. Now, the formal British takeover was the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars. 1795, the French occupied the Dutch. 
the British declared war on France. 1796, they sent a force from where? From Barbados, <laughs> of all places, to occupy the Dutch colony, right? And the British takeover in 1796 was bloodless. And the Dutch administration of the region was left relatively uninterrupted to run control of it, you know, of, of the Constitution. But in, in 1796 to 1802, the three colonies, call it colonies if you want, Burbis, Damarar, and Essequibo were under British control. And by means of another treaty in, in Europe, both were returned to the Dutch. But peace was short-lived, and a year later, Britain and France fought again. In 1803, Guyana was seized once more by British troops. At the London Convention of 1824, so it's shaped by the colonial powers, you know, as I mentioned, both all the colonies were granted to the, to the British, to Britain. So in 1831, Burbis, Demerara, and Essequibo were unified as British Guyana. The colony, as such, call it a colony, would remain under British control until Guyana's independence in 1966. Now I go back to this business about New York, right? The Dutch in New York, which was New Amsterdam, they were under pressure from the British. The French were under pressure from the British in Canada. The Spanish were under pressure from the British in, in the southern part of South, Ameri uh, of South of North America, right? You know, New Orleans, etc. And the Dutch realized, well, hang on, I can't, we can't fight the British here. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna win this war, right? So there was a guy called Peter Stuyvesant and he surrendered New Amsterdam to the British in 1664 and said, well, okay, what are you gonna give us in, in, in return? And the, and the English said, oh, we give you, we give you Guyana and we, you can have it. And, it. and he said, okay, that sounds good because they wanted to control Guyana. El Dorado might just still exist in, in the Guyanas, right? And they accepted it, they took it, and they built the capital in New Amsterdam. So New Amsterdam from New York became New Amsterdam in Guyana. And it is still New Amsterdam today. It has never changed, you know? A bit of a bore, but it shows the turbulent history of Guyana under the three colonial uh, countries. I'll just jump forward here. That's what we like to think of ourselves, you know? Regal, powerful, be like Guyana, like a, like a, like a jaguar, right, you know? That is the current Parliament House, which is still the Parliament House in Georgetown, and that was started in 1834, you know? So I'm gonna try, you a, uh, try to show you a few of these things. The next one is very interesting, because nobody knows this, I'm sure. I didn't even know it. How could you know it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Not, <laughs> I'm presupposing stuff, you know. But in, but in British Guiana in 1848 built a five mile long railroad from Georgetown to a place called Plaisance. It's still Plaisance today, which was the first railroad ever built in South America. The first railroad ever built in South America, imagine that. Peru and Chile opened theirs in 1851. You know, 1848, 1851. Brazil, 1854. Argentina, 1857. Venezuela, 1877. And French Guiana never, ever had a railroad built, never. And then we also notice trams. What does that mean? Well, British Guiana then also had the very first trams in South America. Imagine that whole of South America, twice the size of Australia, this tiny little place of Guyana. In 1877, the trams were horse-drawn, but eventually they were all electric, and they ran amazingly. I mean, I, mean, I didn't even know they had electricity in 1890. You know? <laughs> you know? But from 1901 onwards, they were all electric and they ran until 1930 when they were sold off and they never ever ran again in Georgetown. Some of the old electric trams were actually sold to Trinidad and they ran in Port of Spain. I am not sure when they might have also stopped in Port of Spain. Perhaps some of the Trinis here 
might like to give me some guidance about when the electric train stopped. But then, maybe not, because you're all so young in the audience, you can't remember that time, you know? <laughs> it's impossible. So we're going to have a look now at the things that fashioned Guyana. Some of the colonial style construction of interesting and beautiful wooden buildings in Georgetown. And that includes uh, St. George's Cathedral, all made of wood, reputed to be the tallest wooden church in the world. And the next to it is the St. Andrew's Kirk. The Sacred Heart Church, yes, the Sacred Heart Church is good. That unfortunately was all wood, and that unfortunately all burnt down. It all burned down, don't blame me, when Gail and I got married in that church. <laughs> you know, so I don't have anything to do with it. But again, a wooden building, very distinctive style, and of course you could see the Sacred Heart at the top, you know, Christ with the Sacred Heart at the top, Roman Catholic. And then the, um, really quite a magnificent uh, cathedral, Roman Catholic cathedral, built in stone. It was started, um, as you can see there, quite a long time ago. And you will also notice the name Brickdam is Dutch, but it's still Brickdam, Brickdam, you know, it's uh, still a lot of names. And then Stabrook Market, a famous market, um, still going with a big clock. It was a little bit under disrepair, but they've, they've since once again fixed it up. The clock works again, and it's the major market in, in Georgetown. And it's, it's very interesting to go through it. Now we're gonna have a, a, a little bit more of a look at other wooden buildings in Georgetown. And one of the things that I would like to show you is look at the windows of, of there and there, right? Um, I can't get it to work, it doesn't matter. They are called Demerara windows. You push them out and you, you lock it into place with a stick. It has two sides. sides. It has a little windowsill, which many people put a potted plants on top, right? When the rain came, you pull the stick in quickly and you put a little hook to hook it. And it, it let the air in, but it didn't allow the rain to go in. Really ingenious and truly wonderful Demerara window. Is a, you must say that. It kept the rain out and the evening sea breezes. You've got to remember, Georgetown is by the coast. So everybody was just hoping for those sea breezes to come in to cool things down. And the Demerara windows, if it was raining, would still let the breeze in. Mm -hmm. Look at another beautiful Watuka house with the palm trees, right? And you will notice that the bottom of the palm trees, I never could figure out why, but they were painted white, you know? Mm -hmm. And quite a few of the, of the palm trees were painted white. Um, I don't suppose it had anything to do with the, <laughs> with the British colonial. <laughs> but anyway, so they were painted white. Okay. And we go forward now to that. I don't know if you can remember those beautiful fan palms. They were gorgeous, you know? They just spread out like that. And um, in the botanical gardens, other parts of Georgetown, beautiful palm trees, you know? I'd like to show you now, I'll come back a little bit later, some more shots of the, of the buildings, Mount Roraima. Again, it's a difficult one for someone who hasn't actually been to Guyana to think of Mount Roraima. And even if you lived in Mount Roraima, it was not an easy place to get to, right? Mount Roraima is the highest plateau in all of South America, in the whole of South America. There's nothing as big as that, right? It was first described by Sir Walter Raleigh before he got his head cut off in his 1595 expedition. It covers 31 square kilometers, 31 square kilometers, and is about nearly 3,000 meters in height. The first known ascent could have been plenty others before that, but the first known ascent was by two guys, a, a guy called Everard and another called Harry Ingus, with several Guyanese Amerindians. The location of Roraima is a triple border point between Venezuela, Guyana, and Brazil. And on the very top, they actually have pools that you could swim in if you, <laughs> if you, if you had enough courage to get up to the top, right, you know? Um, you could actually swim in there. And there's a guy called um, 
Arthur Conan Doyle. He used to write books and etc. He wrote a novel called The Lost World in 1912 based on Roraima, the Roraima Plateau, right? And, and that was also turned into a hit film. I never saw it, but I'm going to try and find it in 2015. Um, I, I think they just called it the lost, the lost World. Yeah. We come back now to this talk of Lost Worlds and El Dorado and etc. I find these Timiri petroglyphs fascinating. And I, it's a very sad thing for me to say that I never actually saw them. I only saw them like this. And I would have loved to have had the time and energy to have gone up uh, and, and to see them, you know. The figures are, yeah, I can go forward one more. The figures are still very clear after so many years, and they're possibly still undiscovered areas with these Tamiri uh, petroglyphs. Suriname, close. Brazil, the, the part touching, and Venezuela, the part not so much in, in Cayenne, you know. I find them quite intriguing, and they have those, they make jewelry. Uh, I've got some cufflinks with the Timiri uh, engraving on it, you know. Ancient civilizations or what? Now, for those who might like to go to Guyana, I want you to think again. <laughs> because, because these are some of the animals in the jungles you should try to avoid, right? You know, Don't go swimming too much with the piranhas. Try not to get eaten by an anaconda. The jaguar and the black, the black jaguars, yes, there is a black jaguar, and they are bird-eating spiders. Really quite horrible to see. I look at the size of the hand there, right, you know? I know. Look at you. If, if you really want to test your faith and your luck, go, <laughs> go swimming with the black caiman alligators, right, you know? But I don't think you should try that. Um, you could, of course, have a shocking affair with electric eels and then the pumas. And this is a true story. I think it was in the 60s. There were two English guys. They used to have a lot of, um, I forget the name of them, but it, it was people who came from England to work in Guyana. Um, mm -hmm. What? Yeah, yeah, ex no, no, expats, expats, but there was a name. They used to come and work. The Americans were called AI, huh? Yes, yeah. And they came. Well, two of these guys went up in the Essequibo area there, right? You know, by the big rivers, etc. And they told them, do not go swimming. They got electric eels. Yeah, you know, but they go swimming. Zap, zap, zap. They were all killed. They were swept over the waterfall. But they did find the bodies, and they took them back to England. <laughs> they did. They did. Now, I, I admire this, 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 this eagle. It's called the Harpy Eagle. The Harpy Eagle in Guyana, I think they have some in, in, in Venezuela too, but I forget them in Brazil, you know, Guyana, is the largest eagle in the world and the most powerful raptor found in the rainforest. You know, they can never say uh, if it's true or not that they, they used to swoop down if they saw an infant in the Amerindian village or loosen, and they go with the, the, you know, you see, that guy knows, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, and they would take them away, you know? I mean, so powerful, you know, these animals. Okay, the arapaima. Now, this is the largest freshwater fish in the world, the arapaima. It is actually quite prehistoric in its own right. And I've got two shots there you can show. I don't know you can, how they could hold it up. So the, anybody recognize the guy on the left there? You do, you do, you do? Yes, yes, he's from the BBC series. Um, I think his name, River Monsters. Jeremy, Jeremy yes, yeah, Jeremy Wade, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was there. Okay, now the giant anteater. A docile animal? Maybe. But no animal in the jungle tangles with the giant anteater. It has a coat that is so dense and bushy it has these massive forearms with these huge claws that rips open the ant's nest. If a jaguar was to attack it, it would attack it, it would just lock those claws into the jaguar, and the jaguar would never get out of it. 
So everybody leaves the giant anteater alone, you know, you know. Let go, let the ants have him, you know. Now, now some wildlife that you should not avoid. <laughs> you know, no, no, you should not. Mashromani. Okay. It's the annual Mashromani celebrations and parades. You know, I was trying to find out the meaning of Mashromani and I I, I can't. I haven't found it. Huh? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, you know, Mashramani. Everybody, Mashramani, Mashramani. Now, it's, it's obviously, maybe, I've got to give some credence here to the Trinidadians, not as good as the Trinidad Carnival, you know, <laughs> you know, but then there are not many that are as good as that. Maybe Brazil, you know, maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay, so rather than talk on a lot, a lot now more about Guyana. This is Guyana. So I'd like to show you some of the, of the uh, buildings that go back from the Dutch, the French, and the, and, and the English, but with a distinctive Guyanese style of building and very unique to Guyana. I think there you would recognize the Dutch influence. You see the Dutch influence here, the Dutch influence. English, of course, very Guyanese. That could be French. It can't be 100% sure, but, but, and they, 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 they meld it together in a distinctive Guyanese style of building. Hopefully, the, some of them still, still survive today because they're all made of wood and they can burn down very easily. They had two, two massive fires in Georgetown which destroyed too many buildings. Buildings like um, uh, the Palm Court, um, the Park Hotel, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, it was terrible. But it's made of wood. Coven John was a place outside of Georgetown. People used to go up there to Coven John. I don't know where the name came from again, you know, Coven John, you know. But it's something, yeah. Again, here, uh, different styles of buildings, you know. It's uh, quite a unique style. Georgetown was, was very unique in the style of its beautiful buildings, you know. Different churches here, you know, really beautiful. And here again, we have some of the houses where you can see the, the windows. And um, it was truly, no, you remember the Burbies chair? Ah, you see, good on you, man, good on you. That was a fascinating Guyana invention, you know. <laughs> Those little arms that are tucked back there can actually swivel out. So you could lie back and you don't want to hang your legs. Oh, put, swivel up, put your legs up top, you know. And you, you know, very easy to fall asleep. Yeah, here, uh, the arms here. The arms there, you see? They, they, can, they can swivel out. And you can, like an armchair, you put your legs out, you know. So the Burbies chair. All right, now, I'm showing you here a Dutch coca. The Dutch coca of course, was built by the Dutch, right? And it has a, a, a huge wheel that had to be turned. <laughs> I find it fascinating with the Dutch. The Dutch is controlling Guyana. They've got hundreds of miles to go back from the sea. What they're going to do, they're going to build a seawall. <laughs> that stretch for 300 miles from all and block the sea out, right? And then they thought, well, okay, this must be New Amsterdam. This must be like Dutch, you know, so we build a seawall. The tide can rise 18 to 20 feet at high tide, right? So they had to find some way to, to keep the tide out. So they built these cokers and the canals that ran through Georgetown. And they would lock them off when the tide was rising. When the tide subsided, they would open the coker and all the water left inside would, would drain out. A lot of the water left inside was from rain, right? Because it would rain and it couldn't open the coker, you know what I mean? So it was, it's, it's a fascinating thing. Those cokers are still working today. <laughs> you know, it's quite amazing. And um, I don't think it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I, I think I nearly lost my life there. So I wouldn't have been here today because when you swim in the coker, it could be quite far up in the canal and they open the coker and that water pulls you out. Oh, Jesus Christ. You're scrambling to get to the bank. 
And, and the Dutch um, also built these lovely canals throughout Georgetown, beautiful canals. Unfortunately, to my way of thinking, the British filled in a lot of them and made promenades, you know, like Camp Street, etc. you know. I would have preferred to have seen the canals as they were originally designed by the Dutch. You could have had the Venice of South America. You know, it's possible. But no, they put them and they put a pavement and they put this and of course, Georgetown now suffers a lot from flooding because they, they abandoned the Dutch canals and the Dutch cokers. The Rupununi Savannah, for those of us who have uh, had a chance to go, is, is, is flat, wonderful cattle country. All the beef and everything comes from there. And um, the cowboys are called... Hmm? Vaqueros, vaqueros, vaqueros. Yeah, they're not called cowboys, they're the vaqueros. A lot of them are Amerindian uh, vaqueros. And they do the rodeos and the lasso, they, uh, they're, they're quite wonderful. So that's a, the Savannah country. In Georgetown, in the Botanical Gardens, you got Kissing Bridge. It was the mission of every young guy and his man to kiss a girl on that bridge. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just say Kissing Bridge. I don't want to kiss you. All right, all right, but it's Kissing Bridge, you know. So <laughs> and the Victoria lilies that I, I spoke about are truly magnificent. They would actually flower in the center with either uh, white or purple, etc. And they claimed a child could actually stand in it without it sinking, but I, I never tried it. Um, <laughs> um, they used to have in, in, in those ponds too, they had uh, big manatees, you know, they, and they would come and eat the grass, you know, and you would feed the grass. And then if you get them annoyed, they would turn up and splash water all over you, etc. But that's the but beautiful gardens, beautiful, yeah. Now, I don't know, there's a guy going to visit Guyana sometime soon, Pat? Yeah, put your hand up. In the interior, mainly along the rivers, these new eco resorts are opening up. And um, they're quite, uh, quite beautiful. Uh, just and, and in Rupununi, uh, you got Karanamba Lodge, you got Dadanawa Ranch, uh, up in uh, you got uh, Bagnara Island Resort and Shanklands. I think Ralph and Michelle went to Shanklands and stayed there. Beautiful. You got swimming. You got lovely food. El Dorado rum, you know. So <laughs> think about it, you know. Uh, and then there's another one in Barakara Island. Now, I'm going to go through this with you. I think, boy, you know. Who can forget crab axe, you know, or pepper pot with kasri, metaji with salt fish, or getting hungry straight away, you know? Cook up rice with, with plantains, right? Curry hassa or bangamiri with, with, with roti. Dalpuri with potato balls and souri. Farage peanut punch, oh my God, that farage man, you know? And puma soy drink, that was terrible. And it, <laughs> sorrel drink. Yes, of course. Moby. Moby. I don't know. You can get Moby. I don't know. You can't get it anymore. Who can remember Vimto? Ah, yes. Thank you very much. Vimto. I think you can still get Vimto in India. Anyway, that's what somebody told me. Yeah. Icy tonic. And then, of course, you had ice cold Banks beer with XM rum. Beautiful beer. Brown Betty ice cream. Banana splits. You're trying to impress the girlfriend. Let's go to Brown Betty, you know. It's all right, you know. Tennis rolls with cheddar cheese. Man, you go to the corner shop, you say, what a roll with cheese inside of it, and you cut it up quick time. And cassava puffs, puffs with uh, curry or fish. Garlic pork. Oh, God, you can smell it. Yeah. <laughs> Rice black pudding. Not potato black pudding, like Trinidad. Rice black pudding, rice black pudding is different. We think it's better. Chicken fried rice and chicken in the rough. Anyway, we could go on. Barra with spicy sauce from the bicycle vendor, the bicycle vendor coming. Barra, barra, okay, okay, come, you know. And then roast chana. The roast chana, the little chickpeas in little uh, cylinders. You, you bite them and you chew it out and it broke your teeth occasionally, you know. Tamarind bowls, and then who can forget shave ice? 
the shave ice man come in and he, <laughs> and he shaves it with, with like a, like a, like, like a, a shaver, you know? He pack it. If you got an extra penny, he say you want condensed milk on the top? Yes, thank you very much, you know, but you got to pay for the condensed milk. Put raspberry or strawberry syrup or whatever, you know? So then we go on, you know, Ginnips, Ginnips, can you remember Ginnips? Nice man, you know, nice. And, um, and then uh, again, I don't want to draw a comparison to my Trini friends, you know, <laughs> but the Buxton Spice Mangoes was sweet, man. I know in Trinidad you got your own, yes, yes, and that is lovely. So we sort of, sort of come full circle to the end of, of El Dorado and the Guyana. And there's a possibility of one more, Alicia, um, just showing here once again the coat of arms. And I, I don't think there's anything else after that, but we can try. <laughs> Nothing after that. So what I was going to tell you there with the coat of arms was the gold of El Dorado was always there, but in the Guyanas. But they had to dig for it, they had to mine for it. It wasn't there on a platter to be given to the, to the, the conquests and the conquistadors or whoever would come for plunder and conquest. But yes, El Dorado and the gold in Guyana is, is beautiful. Very, very good. So thank you very much. Not too long, hopefully. <laughs> 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 yes. And they export it and bring a lot of wealth to Guyana? There's a fair amount of gold in Guyana still. Interestingly enough, a lot of it, they have to dive in the rivers with helmets and everything, and they use, they use huge suction pumps to pick up the gravel bring it back to the surface, and then filter it and trays. So it's, it's quite a, a labor-intensive job and quite dangerous for the divers who go down because they're just pumps that, are, you know, they're pumping a tube up. You know, it's not a scuba or anything. It's a big helmet. But the big discovery as of today, and today, of course, maybe six months, is massive oil in the north, just off the coast of, of Guyana massive, massive oil, equivalent to the Middle East. So, the, mm, so now Venezuela is saying, hang on, we want part of the action, and you know, the usual story, right? But the question always will be, how is the oil used? Used for the people? Very good. Used for pockets? Not good, <laughs> you know? So that's going to be the, uh, the question. Mm. In, in the yes, no, yeah, already. Mm. Yeah. Massive, massive oil, yeah. The Americans in their red mini wages. They are there, the usual. <laughs> yeah, the usual, you know. And diamonds, don't forget diamonds. Diamonds is very important to Guyana. Um, the quality of the diamonds are superb. Yeah, <laughs> you want to figure there. Yeah. A diamond comes in many different, the best diamond of all is the pure white diamond with no blemishes through it, right? Um, and that's a pure white, more expensive. <clears throat> the diamonds are not the size of the South African diamonds, but you can easily get diamonds, one carat, one and a half carats, even up to two carats, cut and polished, right? When you have a slight imperfection, it's VSI, very small imperfection. And if you have a VVSI, it's a very, very small imperfection. And as you go down the line, you, well, it costs you less, you know, to buy the diamonds, you know. But if you want a pure white, then Guyana would be the place to get the diamond from. Mm. Mm. Mm, pure white. <laughs> yeah. I think I didn't know that when I lived in Trinidad. Any other questions? You, sir? Not a question, um, just an observation. Um, I am Guyanese, by the way. And um, uh, Tim, congratulations. <laughs> Job well done. Um, 
you actually took me down memory lane, I must say. <laughs> and um, there were quite a number of things that uh, you touched on. Very, very well researched. <laughs> um, but one thing I'd just like to um, pass this on to people, and that is um, with Kaichor. Kaichor has got a legend. And um, the Amerindian word is, Kaichor is actually an Amerindian word. It means um, old man horse. And the legend has it that when the chief, he knows when his time is up, he will dress in his full regalia, and he will go in his canoe, and he will go on the fall, and he will stand there and just pass away. Yes, that's the legend. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Pat, perhaps, um, perhaps we should just mention something that was in the presentation, but I bypassed it, is the prevalence of names that are still Dutch. Um, I flocked, Vicen, you know, Vicenjun Road, Vicenjun Road, you know, Ver, Work in Rust, you know, Better for Wachten. These are all na names always still in use. Stabrook, of course, Brigdam Cathedral. And then, to a lesser extent in my memory, with some of the French names, but like Versailles Estate. You know, Versailles in, in Estate, Sugar Estate in Guyana, and Mon Repos, and so forth, you know? So, so there's, there's a huge colonial background mixed up in Guyana, which is not quite the same as in Trinidad, where you had more, once the Spanish were gone, they were gone. We, we just, we kept going back and forwards, you know? Yeah, uh, musical cheers, I called it, if you remember, you know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. It's Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's good. <laughs> you don't want me to open it? Oh, okay. <laughs>